Choosing the right technology for your mobile app can make or break your entire vision. With so many options out there, how can you decide? Because you surely don't want to realize later that it was a bad decision and you have to start over. On the flip side, you also don't want to invest hundreds of hours or a lot of money if there's a simpler way. Well, in this video, I'll walk you through the key factors to consider when picking the technology for your app and we'll even simulate some scenarios with real numbers for cost and development hours so you can see how it plays out. Wait, so you'll tell us how much it costs to build an app? Whether you're a developer looking to build your own app or a founder who's looking for a team, by the end of this video, you'll know exactly what to do. So let's go. If you're new here, my name is Dan. I'm a mobile software engineer with nearly 10 years of experience in building iOS and Android apps for both startups and big companies. I'm still doing that now, while also sharing my knowledge and experience here on YouTube and also on Instagram and LinkedIn. So with all these frameworks and tools, making a suboptimal choice for your app can lead to higher costs, longer development hours, or even poor performance. I made a full breakdown of the technologies you could use in another video, which also happens to be my most viewed video on the channel so far. You can check that out for a deeper technical dive, but today we're zooming out and looking at the bigger picture. As a short recap, your options are native iOS and Android apps separately, cross-platform apps made with Flutter, React Native or Kotlin multi-platform, and hybrid apps or progressive web apps, or even no-code tools in some cases. There are three main things that you need to consider when choosing the technology for a mobile app. First, your target audience and platforms. Then, the project requirement and complexity. And finally, resources. Your budget and your knowledge. I have a story to tell for each one and a couple of key points to consider. So let's take them one by one, starting with target audience and platforms. Ideally, you want to target both operating systems, iOS and Android, for a higher reach. However, that's not always necessary, depending on the problem that your app is solving. Oh, so my app needs to solve a problem? Definitely. And for example, at Fitskin, a startup I'm working with for several years, our goal was to build the easiest and most accurate solution for skin analysis and for color matching. So we tailored our solution and skin scanners to iPhones, which are usually more consistent and oftentimes better on the camera side because we are using the iPhone's camera along with the scanner to scan your skin. So in this case, it was a no-brainer to go on the native side and use the camera APIs and frameworks that iOS provides, like AV Foundation. And later down the line, if there's a demand for that, we can also build it for Android. But for now, we solve this problem. Another example would be if you have a transportation company and you need an app for your drivers or for your people to scan parcels or to track tasks and routes. So in that case, you can just build a native Android app and provide them with Android smartphones because usually they need an additional device anyway. So you can build it natively for Android and you get the job done. Same if you have a restaurant and you need an app for table and order management, you can build an Android tablet app and install tablets in your restaurant and uh, there you go. So in these cases, when you can solve your problem using just one platform, go on the native route. It offers you the best performance and flexibility and the only downside that you don't cover the other platform doesn't really apply to you. All right, but if that's not my case, if I want to reach a lot of people, in this case, things are a bit more complicated. Because, for example, if you need 100 hours to build the app for iOS, if you also want it for Android, you'll need 100 more to build it for Android because it's a separate platform, a different code base. So you end up with a total of 200 hours worth of work. However, with solutions like Flutter or React Native, you can have a single project, one code base, and then build and distribute the app for both iOS and Android from that same project. You might ask, why isn't everybody doing this? It seems like you get two times the results for the same effort, right? Well, these frameworks are abstractions on top of the native layers and they have some limitations. To understand what these are, we need to get into the second big thing we need to consider when choosing the technology for our app. And that is project requirements and complexity. Most of today's apps are data-driven, meaning they get data from the cloud through an API, they display it to the users, they allow people to change that data and also to update it again through an API in the cloud. Some examples would be shopping apps like Zara or social media apps like Instagram or Facebook and even booking apps for hotels, airlines or trains. In these cases, where you need to make network requests and parse and process data and display it via a nice user interface, frameworks like Flutter or React Native can be a great choice. 
their abstraction layers are working well, so you get both the iOS and the Android app from the same code, and there aren't many situations where you can have problems. And that's what Airbnb thought as well, building their app with React Native until they were proven wrong. As the app was growing in size and complexity, they found themselves doing more debugging instead of writing code and building features in React Native. They explain in a full article that because of the slow pace and the high number of blockers and problems, they eventually decided to switch to native. And it's a real pain to do that when your app is so big. Things also get complicated when you need to leverage the hardware capabilities of the smartphones. These are not always handled so well by the abstraction frameworks, especially when it comes to edge cases. For example, if you need your app to record videos in super slow motion at 240 FPS, or if you need GPS tracking and geofencing, for example. You can write your own plugins and native modules in Swift and Kotlin for these kind of functionalities, but if you have to do that several times, maybe it's better to build separate native apps from the beginning. Otherwise, what you hope to be close to 100 hours in our example, ends up getting closer to 200 actually due to all these exceptions and the additional code you need to write. So you end up with roughly the same amount of effort invested in this, but you don't even have the best performance. Be careful about that. It seems complicated. Can I know this when starting out? First, you can subscribe here to stay up to date with everything in mobile development and programming. But here's what you can actually do. Before starting an app and choosing the technology for it, write down all the must-have features that it needs to have for the short and mid-term, and also think about some of the long-term features you would need. Then you can evaluate how many of these can be easily tackled by cross-platform framework and which ones would need maybe native plugins or extra effort on the development side and might represent a risk if you go with cross-platform instead of native. It's hard to say how many of these are too many, so it helps to have someone with experience beside you to evaluate this together. Two good rules of thumb are any hardware-related features might cause problems on cross-platform, especially if you don't just need the happy flow. For example, taking a picture or detecting your location once, that's okay, compared to slow motion recording, as I said, or geofencing and continuous location tracking. Then, industries with sensitive data like banking or healthcare, or real-time actions like in trading apps, this could really benefit from the native security and performance optimizations that you can do for each operating system. If these don't apply to you, then probably React Native or Flutter should be good choices for you, for your app idea, saving you both development time and money. Oh, and if you're wondering which one to choose and where does Kotlin Multiplatform stand, because you didn't really talk about it, well, we need to get into the third big thing that you need to consider when choosing the technology for your app, and that is your resources budget and knowledge. You'll see in a moment why they are grouped together. Flutter and React Native are quite similar in terms of performance, development speed and community support. React Native could offer you a better native UI feel, while Flutter offers you better flexibility and consistency between iOS and Android, if your app needs that, like the identical feel. You can find benchmarks that praise one or the other, but I think this choice depends more on skills, either your skills or your teams. People with background and experience in web development will find React Native more familiar, while those who mostly worked on mobile apps, especially with SwiftUI and Jetpack Compose, they will find Flutter a bit more intuitive and close to what they're used to. And that's what I also noticed when I learned Flutter after years of iOS and Android development. So the less time you need to spend learning and adapting, the better it will be for your total cost, energy and money. If your background or your teams is fully native, like Kotlin and Swift, then it's worth looking at Kotlin multiplatform. As I explained in my other video, you'll use Kotlin to write and share as much business logic as possible. Things like network requests, data processing, offline storage, and even preparing the data for UI in view models, for example. You can share that too. Then you'll create the UI separately with SwiftUI and Jetpack Compose, which will give users that native feel on both platforms. The downside is that you need to write more code than with Flutter or React Native because you need to create the UI twice. And Compose Multiplatform aims to solve that, but the iOS side is still in beta and it's not quite stable. However, Kotlin Multiplatform should be faster than separate native apps because you get to reshare a big part of the business logic and some integrations. And if you and your team have background in Swift and especially in Kotlin, then it will be easier to adapt than adapting to React Native or Flutter. So from a total of 200 hours in our example, if we assume that half of it is UI and half of it is business logic, then you automatically save 50 hours because you write the business logic just once, assuming you don't have any integration errors, of course. And speaking of that, on the budget side, everybody wants to save time and money. So the budget question actually is how much do you have and are you willing to invest? 
close to 200 hours or not a lot over 100 and we'll switch to dollars in a moment. Are you willing to take the risk with a cross-platform framework to get closer to 100 invested hours? And this could go smoothly, by all means, it's not impossible. Or do you prefer to be on the safer side, closer to 200 with a native approach, while also getting better performance and less problems along the way? And what if I don't have enough even for 100 hours? Well, in that case, there's not a lot you can do other than look at some no-code tools like Flutterflow or Application Studio, but they still offer a below average experience. So I only do that for a very, very simple app with a couple of screens. Or if you also need a web application and you have the budget for that, you can look at progressive web apps or hybrid frameworks that will allow you to reuse a lot of that web-related code and technology in general to have a, a mobile app. That's not my area of expertise, so instead of diving deeper into that, let's wrap up our mobile-specific technologies by looking at them side by side. With the native approach, we had the example of 100 hours per platform, so that makes it 200 in total. Building the same app with Flutter or React Native could get you closer to 100 in theory, but in practice, it's somewhere between 120 if everything goes smoothly, to maybe 160 or over if you hit a lot of blockers and problems along the way. It's harder to debug, you might need to write native code. So yeah, it's harder to predict compared to the native route. As for Kotlin multi-platform, it should be around 150, but the more UI you have, more screens, and also like if you have integrations that are not supported yet, like Google Maps, and you need to integrate that separately for iOS and Android, it cannot be done in the shared module. This number increases again to 170 maybe, depending on how many of these you have. Of course, this will get better over time because Kotlin Multiplatform starts to support more such libraries like Room and Data Store, so it will get better. When in doubt what to choose, always go back to the three main things we discussed. Target audience and platforms, you might be able to solve the problem using only one platform. So in that case, build natively for that platform at full speed. Then app requirements and complexity. Pay attention especially to hardware integrations and, and to the long-term plan of your app and, and what complications it might add along the way. Because you don't want to end up like Airbnb, right? I mean, they are still here, but uh, they had to make that hard choice at some point. And finally, your resources, the budget and the skills. You should definitely consider what you and your team already know. What's your risk aversion towards building this app? And also, how much are you willing to invest and to risk while building this app? As for actual dollar cost, our 100 hours per platform was just an example. But in my experience, building an app will be somewhere in the hundreds of hours. So let's say 500. To make it simple, if you calculate for a rate of a good developer, maybe 40 to 50 dollars per hour, it means that you need to have at least 25k to start with. And it grows with every piece of functionality that you want to add. Furthermore, you might also need the server side, the backend. It's not mandatory, but depending on what app you're building, it's a high chance you need backend as well. Of course, the best strategy is to not build it all at once and to go in small iterations that are cheaper and easier to validate, so you have feedback and you know how to continue. That, along with how to estimate the project and how much it will take, are topics for future videos. So comment below if you'd like a dedicated video on these topics or any other topics you might like, and also subscribe to stay connected. For a full technical breakdown of the technologies we talked about today, check my most popular video on the channel so far, and also the native versus cross-platform talk that I gave at the tech conference. You'll find it in the description. All right. See you soon. Bye.